And so I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, as we are on these Sunday evenings studying this, the last of Paul's 13 epistles that he writes from a Roman prison cell shortly before his execution on the ocean way. Tonight, as we come in our study of this book, we come to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, and I want us to look at verses 8 through 10. The title of the message tonight is, How to Endure Difficulty in Ministry. I want to begin by reading the passage that will be the subject of our study tonight in the Word. The Apostle Paul writes this instruction to Timothy and to us. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer imprisonment, even for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this sake I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it, eternal glory. Anyone who has ever been involved in ministry knows the difficulties and adversities that come with serving the Lord. There is no more demanding work than that of giving one's life to the work and labor of the Lord. It is a work that is met with challenges and disappointments and difficulties on every side. Serving the Lord involves being engaged in spiritual warfare, the attacks of Satan, the moral failures of other people, the discipline of study in the Word, and the constant needs of the flock. To say nothing of the attacks of false teachers, the demands of reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each one of us is saved to serve. Not a one of us is saved to sit and be inactive. Every one of us have been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and thrust into ministry and service for Christ. And those who are involved in serving the Lord can often become overwhelmed with the demands that are placed upon us. We can be pulled in every direction and be subject to emotional burnout and physical exhaustion and mental fatigue and spiritual depletion. In addition, they are the expectations of other people as we serve the Lord, which can rarely be met and which can heap guilt upon those who serve the Lord because we can never quite reach the mark that others would have for us. This is precisely where Timothy was in his ministry, as Paul writes this letter. The flame of passion within his soul was beginning to be extinguished. This flame was flickering and and all but faltering. Timothy has become beaten down in the demands of serving Christ. He has become timid in ministry. He has become ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, or at least dangerously close to it. Timothy, Paul says, needs to rekindle afresh the flame of the gift within him. At this very moment, as Paul writes, Timothy is at a low point. He is at a low ebb, and no servant of the Lord is immune from the dark valleys of life in which they are serving Christ. Timothy is weakening in his convictions. He is weakening in his commitment. He is weakening in his courage. And the question is, how will Timothy turn it around? How will Timothy rebound spiritually? How will, be Timothy, how will Timothy be restored in full, enthusiastic zeal in serving Christ? Maybe that's where you are tonight. Maybe this is a time of disappointment and discouragement for you. 
And maybe you have gone unnoticed and perhaps you feel unappreciated as, as you have served the Lord. Uh, perhaps other Christians around you, as you have been faithful, you have found them to be less than faithful. And it has become a source of discouragement for you. Uh, perhaps in your service of the Lord, as you have been thrust to the front lines of ministry, you have been met with resistance and met with opposition. Perhaps as you have shared Christ with unbelievers who surround you in your life, you have been opposed and you have perhaps even been isolated from others. And because of this, you find yourself spiritually discouraged and depleted. If so, you are exactly where Timothy was as he served the Lord, and I want to remind all of us that every one of us find ourselves at certain times in our Christian lives down and discouraged. And so Paul writes, in order to bolster the spirits of, of young Timothy, and Paul in these few verses, verses 8 through 10, will seek to inject uh, a dose of of encouragement and spiritual strength and spiritual vitality into the very veins of, of young Timothy, that he will be replenished and that he will be renewed and that he will be restored in his serving the Lord. Now, as we look at these verses tonight, there are three main headings that I want you to note. And this is a message of great practical encouragement for us tonight, but it is built upon spiritual truth. I want you to notice in verse 8 the focus of Christian ministry. If we're to be encouraged in our service of the Lord, then we must have the focus of verse 8. And then second, I want you to note the fight of Christian ministry. At the beginning of verse 9, that there is a, a cost factor in serving the Lord. It, it is not an easy road by which we expend ourselves in the advancement of the kingdom of God. And we, like Paul, will often find ourselves in difficult places in this fight for the faith. And then finally, I want you to note the faith of Christian ministry. At the end of verse 9 and then verse 10, Paul gives some extraordinary doctrinal truths that will strengthen the confidence of young Timothy. And I believe in the process of looking at this tonight, it can have this very same effect in each one of our hearts. And so as we begin this new year, in the Lord's timing as we go through this book of 2 Timothy, I believe that this could be exactly what the Lord has appointed for you tonight in your spiritual life. I want you to begin with me in verse 8. First, I want you to note the focus of Christian ministry. If we are to be filled with endurance and perseverance in serving the Lord, there must be this focus. And if our focus is upon anything else, we will soon become discouraged and want to give up in serving Christ. This must be the focus for every one of us here tonight. Notice how verse 8 begins. Remember Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying to Timothy and what he is saying to us is stay focused upon Jesus Christ. Do not ever take your eyes off of Him. Do not ever forget the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why so often in the Christian life we have a pity party? Do you want to know why at times we are exposed to uh, times of great emotional weakness in our lives? It is at those times that we have taken our eyes off of the Lord and we no longer remember Jesus Christ. As Paul writes this, he is saying, keep before you the example that Jesus Christ set in ministry. 
And really what is on Paul's mind is following up what we looked at last time in verses 3 through 6. When Paul called upon Timothy to, in verse 3, be a good soldier, in verse 5, a, pre, uh, a, 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 a pressing athlete, and in verse 6, a hard-working farmer. When he now says in verse 8, remember Jesus Christ, what he is saying is, Jesus Christ was the greatest soldier to ever engage in spiritual warfare. And Jesus Christ was the greatest athlete who kept the rules of, of the game more so than anyone who ever entered the will of God upon this earth. And Jesus Christ is the most hard-working farmer in ministry that this world has ever seen. When he says, remember Jesus Christ, he is reflecting back upon verses 3 through 6. And what he is saying for us tonight is that Jesus was the supreme model of being the good soldier, of being the rules-keeping athlete, and being the hard-working farmer. And Timothy, as you are tempted now to throw in the towel in ministry, Timothy, as you are in a downward spiral right now in ministry, and you can't pull out of it, Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. Remember His life. Remember His ministry. Remember His sacrifice. Remember how committed He was. Remember His death. Remember everything that you can about Jesus Christ, and you will be strengthened, you will be encouraged, you will be lifted up, and you will be built up in your faith. Now, what specifically should he remember about Jesus Christ? He goes on to tell us in verse 8. And there are two keys here. Number one, that he was risen from the dead. Timothy, you need to remember this. That Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead. Though he was crucified, though he suffered an ignominious defeat, though from human perspective it looked as though he died in defeat, Timothy, remember that God had the last word in his life and in his ministry. Timothy, remember that God did not leave him in the grave. Timothy, remember that God raised up his son from the dead. And Timothy, God, by that very same power, will raise you up and give you supernatural strength to serve the Lord. It is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ by which we overcome emotional defeat and spiritual discouragement. Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 10 that we may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. That's what each and every one of us needs tonight. We need to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to come to experience the power of His resurrection in our lives. And no matter what difficulty and what challenges are facing us tonight, and every one of us have those issues in our lives, we will be encouraged and we will be strengthened and we will be endued with power from on high as we remember Jesus Christ, who was risen from the dead. And then he adds this second reminder, a descendant of David. And this description stresses Jesus' Jesus's humanity. Because it was in his humanity that Jesus suffered what he suffered. And this stresses that despite our Lord's death, he was the rightful heir to the throne of David. And despite his suffering, God rewarded him as the rightful heir of the vast promises of the Davidic covenant. God's own son did not go unrewarded, but God kept all of his promises to his son because he was a descendant of David, and according to the Davidic covenant, God made good on his promises that he had made 
that there would be a greater son of David come from the loins of David who would be raised up, who would be the coming Messiah. For us tonight, we should be encouraged because this same God who kept His promises to His own Son is a covenant-keeping God who keeps all of His promises towards us tonight. And all of His promises are yea and amen. Now, he concludes verse 8 by saying, according to my gospel. In other words, these two truths, the resurrection and Jesus being in the lineage of David, are all essential parts of the gospel. And note he says, my gospel. I trust that every one of us here tonight can say that the gospel is my gospel. What is implied in this is that Paul had committed his life and surrendered his life to Jesus Christ who has been raised from the dead, that He is my Savior, He is my Lord, that this is my gospel. There is a sense of ownership of the gospel. Every one of us here tonight need to be able to say that I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, I remember Him, and this gospel is my gospel. And this must be our focus. Paul is seeking to draw Timothy's attention to what must be his principal preoccupation, and that is constantly and always looking to the example of Jesus Christ. This is what the rest of Scripture calls us to do. Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, consider Jesus. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. I trust that tonight you are riveted upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust that you're like a racehorse with blinders on, that you cannot look to your left, you cannot look to your right, that you cannot be distracted by the various things going on around you, that you have tunnel vision for the finish line, that you see the Lord Jesus Christ who's been risen from the dead standing at that finish line urging you on, And the more that you remember Him, the more that you look to Him, the more strength you will draw from Him, the more you will be renewed on the inside with vigor and devotion for Him. What I would say to us tonight is, in every adversity for the gospel, remember Jesus Christ. In every difficulty that we face in life, remember Jesus Christ. In every trial, in preaching the gospel, and sharing the Word of God, remember Jesus Christ. In times of unjust suffering, in times of mounting difficulties, in times of growing opposition, remember Jesus Christ. Never forget Him. Think of the difficulties He faced. Think of the opposition that was thrown against Him. Think of the mounting resistance that that he faced, and yet he pressed on in the will of God for his life, and he remained in close communion with his Father, and he pressed on towards Calvary and the end of his life with renewed determination to go all the way, to go all the way in the will of God. And when he came to the end of his life in John 17, he said, Father, I thank you that I have accomplished all the work which you gave me to do. Remember Jesus Christ. Remember Him pressing on, pressing on all the way to the end of the work that God had given Him to do. Not a one of us can retire from God's work until we press into glory. Not a one of us can slacken up. Not a one of us can slow down. Not a one of us can ease up. Every one of us must press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus Christ. Now I want you to note second, the fight of Christian ministry. Paul is reminding Timothy in verse 9 that the Christian life and Christian ministry is not getting aboard a luxury cruise ship. It is to mount a warship, a battleship, and that there are dangers on every side. And as we serve the Lord, 
there are storms ahead. And there is much resistance that we will face. And as Paul expresses what he does in verse 9, it is to remind Timothy that the more we advance in serving the Lord, the greater will be the fight that we will find ourselves as we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. So note what he says in verse 9. For which, now we would stop and say, for what? What does the which refer to? It refers back to my gospel at the end of verse 8. That is the antecedent for the pronoun which. For which, in other words, for the gospel, I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. Now, most of us here tonight will never have to pay a price like this that the Apostle Paul faced. But let me tell you this. Every one of us here tonight need to be willing. Every one of us here tonight need to be so yielded to the Lord that we would say, Lord, I'm willing to go anywhere to pay any price, to face any resistance, to suffer any difficulty, Lord, I am yours. I am a living and holy sacrifice. I present my life on the altar to you tonight afresh. Now, as Paul describes his own difficulty, he is reminding Timothy of the enormous price to be a servant of the gospel. As he suffers, he says he is suffering hardship for the message that he has preached, and the cost factor for Paul was arrest, it was for imprisonment, and soon it will be at the cost of his very life. As he is suffering imprisonment, this is Paul's second Roman imprisonment. In his first Roman imprisonment, he wrote the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. He was released from his first Roman imprisonment and he continued with his travels until here at the end he is apprehended and he is taken to Rome where he now suffers this second imprisonment. And as he is here, there is a certain smearing of his name. There is a, a shame that is associated now with him as he is suffering imprisonment as a criminal, uh, this word imprisonment means to be in chains. So Paul is not simply confined in a cell, but that he is suffering being put into bonds. He is confined in shackles or, or fetters. And the point of this, again, is to remind Timothy of the sacrifice that is, that is demanded in our service of the Lord and as Timothy is being met with much resistance, he should not be surprised. He should not be caught off guard. He should not feel, well, what is wrong with me and my ministry? He must understand that it is par for the course, and it is to be expected of God's servants as they serve Him in this fallen world. Now, as Paul speaks of this hardship, there is one signature text that I want us to turn to for just a moment, and it is the Second Corinthians 11, and beginning in verse 23. As Paul, this is the only time in his writings in which he catalogs his sufferings, and he puts into one paragraph, he puts into one section a survey, a flyover, a summary of all of the hardship that he suffered as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And before I read this, let me say, I want to submit to us that every difficulty served to deepen his commitment to Christ. Our suffering either makes us or breaks us. It either breaks us in the sense that we are broken away from our resolve, or it deepens our commitment to to Christ. And for the Apostle Paul, all of his suffering was making him and molding him into the man of God 
whom God was greatly using, and it will be the same for Timothy. Timothy, you will never be greatly used in ministry until you have been broken, until you have been hammered on the anvil of difficult circumstances, until you have been thrown into the fiery trials associated with the gospel. Only then will you begin to be fit for the master's use. So notice in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23, what Paul says regarding his suffering. Now, let me give you just a word of background. There have been many false accusations leveled against Paul by false teachers among the Corinthians. And Paul is is being put into the difficult and awkward position of having to defend himself as a spiritual leader to the Corinthians. There have come in those who were false teachers, and Paul's appeal as a true minister, as a true servant of the Lord, is to point the Corinthians to the suffering that he has endured. And his line of reasoning is, a false teacher would never go through the deep waters of such suffering. He would pack his bags, and he would run, and he would flee to a much easier place. Only one who is a genuine servant of the Lord Jesus Christ would endure and would persevere. And so this is how Paul defends his apostleship as a true God-called, God-commissioned preacher of the gospel of Christ. So with that as background, look at verse 23. For they, servants of Christ, question mark, the they refers to the false teachers. <laughs> Are they true servants of Christ? Question mark. He says, I speak as if insane, meaning there is no way that they are true servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, these peddlers of the devil's lies. But now notice how he defends his true servanthood. I more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Verse 23 is the summary of all of the hardships that he has suffered. Now, beginning in the next verse, he begins to break out the specifics. And he goes through, if you will, a a bullet point punch list of the sufferings that he has endured for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So notice verse 24. Five times I have received from the Jews 39 lashes. According to Deuteronomy 25, 1 through 3, the law of God said that no one could receive more than 40 lashes. It would kill a man. And so as Paul was beaten, he was beaten 39 times that brought him to death's doorstep but he could not find relief in death itself. None of us here tonight can even imagine the cost factor of what it would be to be tied to a post and to be whipped to the point of death and beaten to a pulp. Paul did this for the gospel of Christ. What false teacher would do this? And look at verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. This is a totally different occasion. Three different times. And these rods were flexible sticks that would would actually leave more of a whelp and inflict more pain than if it was a firm rod. Once I was stoned, that was at Lister, where they literally interrupted the sermon, apprehended him, dragged him to the city limits, and picked up stones, and they stoned him, they thought, to the point of death. They left him there thinking that he was dead. And we remember what Paul did in Acts 14 when he was at Lystra. When he came to and came out of being unconscious, he got up and went back into Lystra to finish the sermon. You talk about endurance, you talk about perseverance. That was Paul in the ministry. And then look at verse 25. Three times I was shipwrecked. And then he adds, a night and a day I have spent in the deep. Meaning one of these shipwrecks was so severe 
that Paul had to literally cling to a board that was floating in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and did it all night and all day until someone came and fished him out of the Mediterranean Sea. And all of this was simply so Paul could go from point A to point B in order to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 26, I have been on frequent journeys. Note the word dangers that is repeated in verse 26. Dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. Every one of these dangers was a life-threatening danger in which Paul felt that his life was ready to pass from time to eternity, as Paul felt that he was within uh, uh, an eyelash of death itself, as he traveled through robber-infested mountains, as he crossed flood-prone rivers. And then he says in verse 27, I have been in labor and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, meaning without even the proper clothing, as he would be exposed to the elements. Even as Paul is in Rome in in imprisonment, as he writes 2 Timothy, that is the very circumstance in which he finds himself, as he is in a hole in the ground in the Mamertine prison, and as he writes Timothy, he says, and oh, by the way, would you bring a cloak? Would you bring something for me to put on? and pick up some books, and bring the parchment when you come. There is an indomitable spirit about the man of God, Paul. And then in verse 28, on top of all of these physical dangers that he faced, verse 28, apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? This was the greatest hardship that Paul faced. The constant communication that he received from the elders in various churches as they laid out situations and problems and and difficulties that they were facing and people who were being led into sin and each of these serving almost to, to, to put wrinkles into Paul's forehead and causing him to for his hair to turn gray as he is under the weight and the pressure of all of the churches. This is what accompanies ministry. This is what it is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And none of us will no doubt ever be pushed to these heroic limits of having to invest ourselves in the Lord's work. For us tonight, the Lord has given us a much easier road to hoe in our labors for the Lord. But we, like Timothy, must all remember that ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. And it is only as we are involved in fighting the good fight and making personal sacrifice, and expending ourselves for the ministry of the gospel, does that ministry accomplish much in the name of the Lord. Paul is reminding Timothy of this by appealing to his own life, not to draw attention to himself, but to set the example of his own life before Timothy. Timothy, you've had this little difficulty at the church in Ephesus and things aren't quite working out the way that you would like for them to work out. And there is this pressure group that has risen up against you and there, there are these false teachers who have come in and there are these unqualified elders and these unqualified deacons and there are these women who are usurping their roles in the church and, and on and on and on and on and on. And Timothy is under the weight of this. And Paul is reminding him that this is part and parcel of serving the Lord Jesus Christ, that there will be a great price factor involved for everyone who serves the Lord. I want to ask you tonight, what sacrifice is the Lord asking of you in the service of Christ? What inconvenience is the Lord asking you to give up 
in order that you might change your schedule or realter your path or step forward and, and give yourself in, in new ways to serve the Lord. We have been saved to serve, and such service will always come at a great price with great expenditure of time and talent and, and treasure as we give ourselves to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And Jesus says that as it is with the Master, so it will be with His disciples. And so we must be those who are engaged in sacrificial ministry, even unto imprisonment, if that is what the Lord requires of us. So Paul tells Timothy this. You need to remember Jesus Christ. You need to keep your focus on the Lord. And you need to fight the good fight, and you need to realize that any ministry that accomplishes a hill of beans will come at a great price, a great sacrifice, and it is true in your life, and it is true in my life. Now, finally, I want you to know the faith of Christian ministry. In the middle of verse 9, with the word but, Paul now reminds Timothy of the invincible sovereignty of God in ministry. That God is supreme. That God is greater than every challenge he will face. And he begins at the end of verse 9 by affirming Timothy's faith in the invincibility of God's Word. The invincibility of God's Word. Notice what he says in, in, in uh, verse 9. Paul says that he is suffering imprisonment, but the Word of God is not imprisoned. Paul is saying that he, the messenger, may be thrown into the slammer, but never the message. The preacher may be in chains, but the gospel will never be fettered. The servant of the Lord may be incarcerated, but never the Scripture. The Word of God can never be stopped. The Word of God can never be imprisoned. The Word of God can never be overthrown. And though one of God's servants will go down, God will raise up ten more to advance the message. That is what Paul is reminding Timothy of here. That even when the messenger is imprisoned, the message is not, and the message will advance, and the message will go forward. William Hendrickson, a great commentator of the New Testament, paraphrases these words at the end of verse 9 this way, quote, Paul is saying, though I am bound, the Word of God is not bound. Others will carry on when I have left this earthly scene. The authorities have put me in this dungeon, but they cannot imprison the gospel. It will triumph. It will perform its preordained mission on earth. No enemy can thwart the advance of the gospel and the Word of God." Close quote. I'm reminded of the words written by Martin Luther in A Mighty Fortress is Our God. You'll remember the third and the fourth verses. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for Him. His rage we can endure, for lo, His doom is sure. One little word will fail Him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through Him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. One little word 
is enough to fell our great enemy. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the word, world. And it is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, which is the invincible weapon in the hand of the servant of the Lord. And so Paul reminds Timothy, as Timothy is discouraged and as Timothy is down, Timothy's not even in prison. Timothy is just simply in a tough situation and serving in a local church. And he reminds Timothy, Timothy, you may be hemmed in by your circumstances, and you may feel claustrophobic as you are surrounded by problems on every side, but young men, remember this, that the Word of God is invincible, and the Word of God cannot be imprisoned, and the Word of God will perform its work here upon the earth, and it is the sovereignty of God that will bring it to pass. Isaiah 55, verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. This must be the faith of everyone who is involved in Christian service and ministry. No matter where you serve the Lord, no matter in what capacity, that the Word of God cannot be imprisoned, and my labor for the Lord is not in vain, that it will advance, it will move forward. And this is the very certainty that each one of us must have as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's a second element that he underscores in verse 10 regarding the faith that Timothy must have. Not only the invincibility of God's Word, but in the immutability of God's election. I want you to notice in verse 10, Paul now seeks to lay a cornerstone yet again in Timothy's life upon which Timothy can build, and it is to remind him of the immutability of the sovereign purposes of God in election. When I say election, for those of you who are new with us here tonight, I am referring to that doctrine by which God, from before the foundation of the world, has chosen those whom He will save, and the absolute guarantee that they will, they will, they will come to faith in Jesus Christ. You may say, well, that sounds like predestination. And I say, yea, amen, it does, for that is the very truth of Scripture that everyone who is saved has been predestined by God from before the foundation of the world, and there are not enough demons in hell or out of hell to prevent the elect from coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says in verse 10. For this reason. For what reason? For the reason of the invincibility of the Word of God that it cannot be stopped. It cannot be imprisoned. For this reason. I endure, I press on, I persevere, I press on with greater diligence. I endure all things, whatever the devil can throw at me, whatever this world can hurl at me, whatever obstacles, whatever difficulty may arise before me, I endure all things. What would inject in Paul's soul, such faith, such trust, such confidence in the Lord. Notice what he says. For the sake of those who are chosen. Here is the doctrine of sovereign, unconditional election. Paul is gripped by the deep-rooted conviction that God has selected and predetermined the salvation of individual people from before time began and through storms and through difficulties and through every challenge in ministry, it will not prevent God's eternal purposes from coming to pass. The doctrine of election gives staying power in the ministry. The doctrine of election puts 
steel into our backbone. The doctrine of election pours concrete into our resolve to endure all things in the work of God because there are a people whom God has ordained whom He will save from before the foundation of the world. This is what kept Paul's feet to the ground in Corinth. In Acts chapter 18, he shows up in Corinth. He goes into the synagogue. He reasons with them from the Scripture. They throw him out on his head. He is, he is ready to dust, shake the dust from his feet, move on to the next town, go down the road to Ephesus. And God appears to him in the middle of the night in a vision. And the Lord says to him, Do not be afraid. You stay right here. For I have many people in this city who are mine. No one has come to faith in Christ yet. And it is a clear testimony to the doctrine of sovereign election that God has a people in this city. I don't care how pagan it is. I don't care how lost it is. I don't care how defiled and depraved it is. They will come to faith as the word of God is made known in their ear. God will bring it to pass. God will guarantee the success of His own gospel ministry. And so the doctrine of election is one of the grand truths of the Christian faith. It provides the greatest confidence that God will, will ensure the success of our ministry. It ensures that the gospel will find a home in the hearts of people because of His sovereign authority in bringing it to pass. Let me just say this. I must speak quickly. This is a major doctrine, the doctrine of election. If you are right here, you will be right in 50 other doctrines. And if you are wrong here with the doctrine of election, you will be wrong in 50 other places of theology. This is a touchstone doctrine. It's not a minor truth. It's not an incidental truth. This is one of the major truths of the Word of God. And what should strike us tonight is how many books in the Bible actually begin with the doctrine of election. It's not hidden in the back doorsteps of these books. It's put on the very front page of these books, and it presupposes that they have already been instructed, they have already been well taught and well grounded in this doctrinal truth to be able to begin just a simple letter by immediately appealing to the doctrine of election. Let me just give you some of these books, for example. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Not Ephesians 6, verse 20. Ephesians 1, verse 4. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, without any explanation. This obviously implies that they have already been well taught in this. They have been well instructed. This is fit for public consumption. This is adult conversation. This is something that we all agree in. To deny this is to deny the Word of God itself. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. You can do the math on this. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, the fourth verse in the entire book of 1 Thessalonians. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you. He'll build His entire argument to the Thessalonians in this opening chapter upon the doctrine of God's sovereign election of them. Titus 1, verse 1, the very opening verse of the entire book of Titus. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God. How can you even get past the first verse of this book without scratching your head and going, there it is? In fact, it would be a challenge if someone was going into a church in which the doctrine of election has never been taught, and you are going to preach from chapter 1, verse 1, verse by verse through the entire book, it would be a challenge to find a book to preach through in which it is not taught in that book. And in many of these books, it is there at the very outset. 1 Peter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are chosen. That's how he identifies believers in this letter as those who are chosen. 
2 John, verse 1. The elder to the chosen lady. And on and on it goes. There is a reason why this doctrine is so primary and so emphasized in the Bible. And the truth is that it shapes virtually everything we do in ministry. Let me say that again. The doctrine of election shapes virtually every ministry correctly in the church. It purifies worship. It purifies fellowship. It purifies ministry. It purifies evangelism. It stresses that God will guarantee the success of our evangelism as we spread the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. This doctrine of election teaches that we are called simply to be faithful to God in evangelism and to leave the results with God. So therefore, we do not need to manipulate people. We do not need to use gospel tricks and gospel gimmicks. We simply bring the Word of God hot off the altar to people, and we trust in a sovereign God to call out those whom He has chosen to bring to Himself. This truth teaches that God has His elect who are yet to be saved, and they are all around the world. Out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every people, and out of every nation. Therefore, that means we must go to the four corners of the earth and be willing to meet every challenge and to pay every price that the gospel would go to those as we proclaim the supreme worth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must take this truth to the highways and the byways of the gospel of Christ and fully believe that God has gone before us and that God has marked out people who will believe and who will come to faith in Christ. And Paul was so convinced of this, he was willing to endure shipwreck and being beaten and going without food and going without creature comforts in order that he would continue to preach the gospel because there are those who are elect and who will be saved. We must take this truth of the gospel to all people in all places because God has chosen a bride for His Son. This should shift our evangelism into fifth gear. This truth should energize us and empower us to proclaim the gospel here, there, and everywhere with growing confidence. Paul, as he is in prison says the Word of God cannot be imprisoned, and I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. And notice how he ends verse 10, and I'll wrap this up. So that they... Who is the they? Do you see it in verse 10? So that they... The they refers back to those who are chosen. Refers to the elect of God so that they also may obtain the salvation. They do not now have this salvation, but that they may obtain the salvation. This was Paul's confidence. This was Paul's trust and faith, that there are those out there who will be saved because they are chosen of God. Therefore, I'm willing to risk limb and and life in preaching the gospel so that they will come to faith in Christ. So he says at the verse 10, so that they also may obtain the salvation. And now he gives two qualifiers to this salvation. Let me just draw this to your attention. Number one, this salvation is in Christ Jesus. And number two, this salvation involves eternal glory. That this salvation is in Christ Jesus tells us that every blessing and every saving grace is mediated to the elect through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That all forgiveness is in Christ, all redemption is in Christ, all righteousness is in Christ. And as Christ came into this world, He did so for the sake of those who are chosen. And He laid down His life for ransom for many upon that cross. This also tells us of the exclusivity of salvation in Jesus Christ alone. That there is salvation in Christ Jesus, and there is no salvation outside of Christ Jesus. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all the testimony born at the proper time. So the first qualifier is this salvation is entirely in Christ. 
in his person, in his work, in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension, in his present enthronement. All salvation is found within the sphere of Christ Jesus. And then second, with it, eternal life. And this speaks of the duration of the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus. It is a salvation that involves eternal glory or the glory that will come throughout all the ages to come for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the doctrine of eternal security of the believer, that all who are in Christ Jesus and have this salvation, all who are chosen by God in eternity past, are eternally secure in Christ forever. This verse teaches that from eternity past in the doctrine of election to eternity future in the doctrine of glorification, not a one of the chosen ones will be lost. Paul put it this way in Romans 8, 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, these he predestined. And whom he predestined, he called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. There are no dropouts. There are none who slip through the fingers nor slip through the cracks of eternal glory. I cannot think of a more glorious truth than this. And it's all compact in this one verse in verse 10. That from before, found the time, before the foundation of the world, before time began, God chose His elect. And then, in eternity future, all of these elect will experience and enjoy eternal glory throughout all of the ages to come. Timothy, you better build your ministry on this rock-solid truth. Timothy, in dark times and in difficult hours... When you become discouraged, when you feel like the work cannot go forward, when you feel that you're at the end of yourself, when you are ready to bolt, when you're ready to dash, you just remember that underneath your ministry is the sovereign hands of God who will guarantee the success of the Word of God. And though one of the leaders may be imprisoned, the Word of God will never be imprisoned, and it will move on, and it will press ahead as God will use that Word when it is preached to bring about the salvation of every single one of His elect. This is true gospel encouragement. This is true strength to be received from God. You remember Jesus Christ. You fight the good fight. And you have faith in God's sovereign, eternal purposes as it will move forward. And Timothy, God will have the last word on who is saved as you preach His gospel. I trust that here tonight, as I have preached my heart out, that you will receive the strength in your inner person that God desires for you to have and that you will grow and mature and develop in the things of the Lord, and that we all together will be rock solid in our serving Jesus Christ, and that we together will press on in what God has for us together. Let us pray. Father, Seal to our minds these truths. Cause the seed that has been sown to fall upon fertile soil. Bring forth much fruit in our lives. Etch these verses upon our heart. Make us living epistles of these truths. And above all, let us remember and keep to the very forefront of our minds the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.